The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Our guest today, Kathy McDaniel, is one of those rare experiencers who has suffered through a distressing NDE, which we call a DNDE, and is now, 20 years later, ready and willing to talk about what she went through. I say rare because although uh, at least one in 10 NDEs are unpleasant or even terrifying, most DNDEers are so shell-shocked by the experience that they don't want to talk about it ever. Kathy, on the other hand, sees herself as a missionary to hell, where one can save themselves and actually help others as well. Placed on a ventilator for lung failure caused by a virulent SARS-type flu in 1999, similar to the COVID-19 we're going through today, Kathy fought for her life in an induced coma for three weeks. During this time, she found herself in an inextricably dangerous, horrifying realm. The effects of the NDE caused her to question her understanding of everything she thought to be factual and irrefutable. And during her long recovery, Kathy continued to struggle to find her place and purpose in life. As memories of former earthly hellish traumas surfaced and seemed to parallel her actual hell experiences, Kathy sought out others with the same story and found Ions to be a valuable resource for hope and understanding. Her book, Misfit in Hell to Heaven, Expot is a memoir of Kathy's tumultuous life before, during, and after her dark, distressing near-death experience. Kathy, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you, Lee. Very happy to be here. Oh, it's good to have you, and I think it's so brave of you to tell this story. Kathy, your book opens with the story of your extended family's life, going back generations and covering your life. Um up to and uh, after your uh, DNDE. And your life has been, to say the least, a series of setbacks, including seemingly a family heritage abuse of alcohol and of a kind of hardness to one another. You were a faithful practicing Catholic through a lot of it, so perhaps your near-death visions of hell were designed for your personal instruction. But anyway, for the sake of time, let's pick up the story where Glenn gets you to the hospital in time to save your life but the only way possible to save you is to induce a coma and put you on a ventilator. So tell us what you saw then. Um, I had the flu and uh, it got worse. And so, yes, I called Glenn and told him I was scared. He took me down to um, a dock in the box place. Uh, By the time he got me there, there was no pulse. They got me to a hospital and I only remained remember briefly doctors coming and going and oxygen tent. And um, it was New Year's Eve right around in there. I remember the ball going down. And then uh, they said, you can't breathe, honey. We're going to have to put you on a ventilator, but you'll be fine. And that's the last I remembered. Um, They told me later that I was on um, white amnesia, which is a sort of a sedative that they put people on to keep them very still uh, so they don't yank their ventilators out. And they told me that I would not remember anything. It was impossible for me to remember anything. Well, so I was gone. I guess the, the best way to explain it is to just take the listener with me. All of a sudden, I became conscious. It was as if I was waking up from just being asleep. And this is how I felt. I'm going to read this part from the book, and um, I'm alerting you to that now. Okay. I didn't feel dead, only confused, total darkness and absolute silence, my only references. Not daring to move, I waited. The blackness morphed into a reddish glow, dragging with it a stinking heat. Acrid fog, muffled moans, and ungodly shrieks. Oh, this can't be good. Something was staring at me. Like a blow, a voice thundered. Do you know where you are? 
My mind raced, searching for some rational explanation, but part of me already knew. Hell, I whispered. To my horror, the answer was an ear-splitting, maniacal laugh. The evil crept closer as I clamped shaking hands over my ears. Panic surged in me, triggering the requirement for fight or flight. Fighting was not an option. I turned and ran. Wow, that's a great opening. So- <laughs> it, it'll set the stage <laughs> for what came next. Well, there, there, now there are a series of events that you participate in, and the first one sounds like the aftermath of some sort of horrendous nuclear war or something. Go ahead and describe that. Well, uh, after I took off and I was taking a leap of faith because it was pitch dark and I didn't know if I was going to fall off a cliff or what was going to happen, but it seemed that as I turned and ran, again, not realizing I was spirit, a dead, I I, uh, came upon this scene. It kind of blossomed in front of me. Uh, Like you say, it looked like, oh, what was that? Uh, There was a movie, God, Planet of the Apes, where they come across the Statue of Liberty and all that destruction, but it was worse. As far as I could see were, were bombed out concrete buildings and rebar sticking out and smoking uh, places and Place is still on fire. The sky, the sky was dark with just that reddish glow, and and in the in the distance, uh, I could see toppled buildings like skyscrapers that domino down on each other with all the windows broken. <clears throat> and again, I was hearing these shrieks and cries, and I was terrified. Mm. So I, good Girl Scout that I used to be, I'm looking for shelter, and I found this little crack where two pieces of concrete had fallen near each other. And so I ducked inside there shaking and and it was darker in that little hole, hoping nobody nobody would see me. And so I I dared to peek out and uh, was looking about and uh, I could kind of see shapes moving, kind of scuttling. It was almost a hissing sound and uh, they were moving from spot to spot like they were moving in on me or something. And I thought, oh, good grief, I was looking for a, a weapon or something that, to help myself. And, and all of a sudden, I looked at a figure that looked like it might be somewhat human. And I called out. and I was so excited. And I said, hello, you know, uh, um, who are you? What's, what's going on? And it was quiet. And I says, please, please, we, why don't we just get together? You know, uh, I'll go look for some food and, and you look for some shelter. We'll start a fire. And he just, this this voice came out of the abyss that says, but we are all alone here. Mm. And I thought, oh, this is, what am I going to do? So I took off running and I'm trying to scale up these slippery pieces of concrete. And um, I could feel, sense things coming towards me. And um, I just closed my eyes. And boom, uh, I opened them to a brand new landscape. It was it was dark, but it was not a city anymore. And there was this huge creature standing there. And um, I was alarmed and shocked, but he wasn't making any moves. He was just kind of looming. And uh, he made some comment about... Uh, you know, you might as well give up. You're not getting out of here. And I said, uh, yeah, I don't know where I am, but I'm not a quitter, man. I will get out of here. He says, no, you'll despair. And I said, no, I won't. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. <clears throat> if you can get out of here, this particular, you know, he didn't say particular place because I didn't know how big of the place was. If you can get out of here, then, um, and by doing a special task, I will okay that and you'll be on your way. I said, fine, what? And he says, turn around. And when I turned around, there's this huge blackberry patch as far as you could see. It was probably 10 feet tall with these, I don't know if you've never ever been in a blackberry patch, but I live in one down the road right now. And I always (laughs) shiver when I walk by, even though I pick the blackberries. But these big spikes 
uh, coming overlapping one another with with big thorns on them. And and I I looked at that and I kind of looked at him and by now it's filled in behind me. And he says, all you have to do, and he's kind of chuckling, which was unusual for a character that looked like he did. He says, just just cut them all down. And my mouth dropped open and and I felt something in my hand and I looked down and there was this pair of like kindergarten kids scissors that they used to cut paper. Mm. And then he starts bellowing with this horrible laugh that I'd heard earlier. And I thought, you know, I felt like a, a mouse to a cat, but I thought if this is my only way out, then that's what I'll have to do. So I leant down scraping myself as I did against the berries. They were so thick and I started cutting and, you know, clawing away at this one branch. And uh, finally I got it to pop uh, apart And I turned around, scratching myself up to start another one. And I looked and that thing had grown back. Mm. And it became very obvious that there was no way I was going to get out of there. So this creature is laughing. And um, I just stood up and I kind of remember just crossing my arms and glaring at him in my mind, thinking that's really not funny, you know, but I'm not going to give up. Mm. And then boom, uh, it's like a light went on or something behind me. And, and now I'm in, a, in another place. And this one was even weirder, but it didn't appear dangerous. It was, um, uh, it was a beauty parlor. It was like a, a, on a, a canted stage. So it wasn't flat. And, and the chairs, there were three chairs and they were placed at odd angles. And there were mirrors in front of each of the chairs and a few little brushes and stuff. But it was like a set from a movie. And I thought, what the heck is this about? Well, then I saw a very good friend of mine up there with two gentlemen nicely dressed. And I thought, well, this is better than the last two places I was. And there's somebody I know, maybe she'll know a trick for getting out of here. And so I stepped up on the stage and she just looked at me and says, I have to explain. This is my a very dear friend who always looked perfect. I mean, this was something that she strove for and she achieved. And she was a little bit looking down her nose on people that didn't value that sort of outward appearance and presence. So I'd been in kind of a mess the last couple of places I'd been here. And she Mm. looked at me and says, wow, you look like hell. And I didn't think it was funny because I didn't really know where I was at the time. And uh, she said to sit down on the chair. And I thought, this is really, really too weird. And then her two friends, whom I knew from a previous place, who were always very nicely dressed gentlemen, uh, came up and started giving me these tips. And I says, you guys, this is really totally not something I need right now. And uh, she says, well, you know, then this is just not going to work out. You're not fitting into the program. You'll just have to leave. So I found myself then walking on this I'm going to hesitate a little bit here because I think I'm going to skip that part and go to the, the next. That that one was a short one. The next one, I found myself like in this hospital uh, corridor. It was white walls, lots of too bright lighting, and, and I'd been in kind of a dark situation. So I'm I'm kind of adjusting to it. Now it looks kind of sterile, and um, I can see a, a, a door to the to the right of me and a door to the left of me, and there's there's light in those rooms. And, and I I thought, what the heck? And I looked straight up and here's another demon. It's not the same one, but demon's the only word I can use. Just not of this world, ugly. Coming down this hall and he's got something raised like he's, you know, uh, I don't know. He, he must have been in a jail somewhere and used this baton to beat up prisoners. But he came right next to me and I had to really look up in the air. And he says, all right. You're mine now, and you've got a job to do, and uh, that's all there is to it. And I said, well, what? And he says, well, you're going to go in that room to the right. He points with his baton. You're going to take whatever they give you, and you're going to walk it across the hall in front of me, keeping an eye on you at all times, and you go in that other room on the left, and you, you deposit what they give you in that room, and then you come back, and you go over, and you do that till I tell you to stop. And you could tell he wasn't going to tell me to stop. Mm. So I thought, well, okay, I, 
Uh, this didn't sound too terribly hard. So when I walked into the room, <clears throat> it was it was a large room and it was had a lot of like gurneys on it. And there were, I guess, I couldn't tell. If they, they must have been women. I, I finally figured out because their, their, their knees were up and, and they had a white, well, bloody sheet across them. And there were doctors between their legs doing some sort of procedure. And um, it dawned on me that this was an abortion clinic. And I thought, what? And uh, this guy's shaking this baton at me. So I, I kind of was in shock. And I walked over one of the doctors raised his bloody hand. And, and I, I, I went up next to him and he took that, that poor little desecrated baby, what was left of it, and slapped it into my arms and says, go on, get out of here. And, and I, I, di I didn't know what to do, except, you know, I was in shock. I, I walked across into the hallway and he just, a demon pointed to the other side and I walked in and there's this huge room, like a Costco warehouse or something filled with mountains and mountains of these poor desecrated babies. And the smell was awful and the sight was awful. And, you know, it was dawning on me. I was, I was not in a very nice place. And I just gently put this little body down and came back out in the hall and he pointed to the other, other direction. And, um, I started to go that way again in shock. And this nurse came out. She had her mask dangling on one ear. And, and I said to her, what is going on in there? What? And she says, Shh, don't talk. And I said, I mean it. What's going on in there? She says, well, those are poor women that they told they were having just a, some procedure, but they're really aborting all these poor babies. And um, and uh, you, you can't talk or stop. You better get in there. And I says, oh, I'm not going to do that. That's disgusting and it's awful and it's wrong and I won't do it. So she, we, we heard the stomp, stomp, stomp of this thing coming down the hall. So she ran and I stood there and that thing loomed over me and said, get in there and do your work. And I said, I'm not going to do it. He says, oh, oh, what kind of punishment are you bringing upon yourself now? And I said, I, I don't care. And, and he raised his, his baton and I closed my eyes and boom, I'm, I'm in another place. Sometimes between these dark spots, I would find myself I'm gonna just, I'm shortening this up. I would find myself on in this dark area with uh, not much landscape to see it all because it was dark and it was a road and it, it just went from place to place. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I would find myself in between places when I would close my eyes. I'd be on this long, endless road and sometimes small things would happen on either side and then boom, I'd be back in some big fiasco again, like I was with this one. Um, and actually I did end up on that road and was walking along that road this time when this next horrible thing happened. Um, I was walking into was like a town because there were people that seemed to be coming and going on this road, but nobody looked at each other. They kept their eyes down. And I felt like, oh, this is not really not going to be safe because now there's all these, they weren't really people. They reminded me of zombies or something because they were like dragging their feet and, and tattered rags. And uh, the smell was not good. And there was murmuring and, and muttering, like maybe they were mentally challenged or something. And, so I thought, well, I've got to get through here. I'm going to keep my head down and I'm going to head straight through. And all of a sudden I could tell when I got that thought out of my head, like it might've been heard or something because they started to kind of slow down. And then several of them started to gather around me and uh, I was really terrified. And um, basically by glancing up, looking for a friendly face uh they were men and they had skin that was like falling off their bodies it was rotting and then the, the ragged clothes and and um oh you know uh, teeth rotting and it was it was like something out of a zombie movie really and they started murmuring to each other and I couldn't understand what they were saying but then one of them pushed me and I and this they crowded around me and another one pushed me back and soon 
I was on the ground and they were on top of me. And I know I didn't have a body at the time now, but then I felt like I did and I was hurt and I was abused and I was a wreck. Hmm. Uh, after a very long time, they started moving back and I felt myself beaten and bloodied and, you know, a wreck. And one of them leaned over and with these horrible teeth and putrid breath and got right up into my face. And he says, now you will be one of us. You will have AIDS and you will not die. You will rot and you will stay this way forever. And then he moved off. I thought, now what? There, I, I, I'm afraid to stay here, but I don't know where to go. And then this woman looked like a person, might have been a person at some time, was dressed in dark clothing, but not rags. And she just pointed and said, you, you're one of us. And I am giving away my whole book here. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think you're going I, to yeah, have, have to shorten it up a little bit. I, I, I've left out a couple parts, but um, <laughs> that was the last time. And there was a, a bunch of other ladies that look like me. And uh, she says, now we'll take you to where you will work, you know, your final place to work. Mm. And the last I'm going to tell is that we, we started the single file of, I don't know, 10 or 12 beaten up, raped, terribly treated, forlorn women walking down this path as the snow started coming down like I'd never seen before. And I remember that the snow was almost chest level. And if we stayed in front of one another, uh, you know, we could go through, but the wind was blowing and I thought, boy, it's cold as hell down here. <laughs> And uh, not in a funny way. I'd lost my sense of humor by then. And we finally got to this cabin where we were told what our, our new um, job description was, which was really not good. And then the miracle happened. Um, I, I, I think I, I, I've got to use this phrase. I think you said whores of hell. Yeah. There. <laughs> give, give them a clue. <laughs> it, was, it was not a job I would have picked. Uh, but at that time I was just about out of, out of hope. And, but I did come through with inadvertently, uh, doing something that encouraged the other ladies to join in with me and un unbeknownst to me how that was going to change things. I would have done it a lot sooner, but, um, I did all of a sudden, Boom, there I was in this huge, beautiful, white light room. It was as hard to describe. It was, it was someplace else, but the, the immediate infusion of joy and love and uh, ecstasy and just, oh my gosh, you know, it was just everything you can ever imagine and more. It's just ineffable. Well, okay, Kathy... <laughs> <laughs> what 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 took you there was was the uh this, this you, have, you have to buy the book and find <laughs> <that>. <laughs> but but it's it's it was such a, a such a gentle thing to do yeah, um, that, it that's, was, that's, it that was. saved you and i'm yeah. gonna tell, i gotta tell them that you sang away in a manger because it was well, that's not very well. Yes, it. Yes, I did because uh, I had said to the the demon lady that was with us, or whatever she was. You know, I've been here a while now, and it seems particularly <sighs> horrid today. Is there something else going on? I don't know about. And she says, "Oh yeah, it's Christmas on Earth uh, tonight, and that's always the worst day in hell." And so, yeah, I. Got a little spunky. And you, know, you know what? It, what it reminded me of was uh, Howard Storm's story about when he, all he does is he thinks of a, a little prayer to Jesus. That's as right. An, as an atheist, he's being dragged away. Just yeah. the mention of the name Jesus or the song that you sing 
is enough to change hell to heaven. And well, it, you know, but but God isn't there, and you don't even think of God when you're there. Yeah. God doesn't go where God doesn't welcome, and God's not welcome in hell. So there was no way for me to pray or or do anything. It just didn't occur to me. And I've been a Catholic my whole life. You know, I was 53 years old, and and I go to church every Sunday, but that never dawned on me. You know why? Because I still didn't know I was dead. Mm. I did not know I was dead till I got to heaven. I thought I was just, I don't know, the vacation from hell. I don't, I, you just, I can't tell you, you got, do you don't want to experience it yourself. Take my word for it. But People when you got, generally you got, don't know they're dead there. Right. When you got to heaven and you saw your, your dear friend who had died, Rick, and that yeah. you were telepathically communicating, you realized because he was dead that you, you must be dead as well. Right. And that's what, you know, I had that. I, I died because of him. I mean, I took care of him for many months when I, he had his leukemia treatments. That's why I was so run down. So we had been engaged and, you know, as a couple for seven years, he helped me raise my kids, send them to college. So we had split up recently within a couple of years, but still he had to go to the East Coast. I was on the West Coast. And so we were still dear friends. So he died. And this is part of the reason I got so depressed and run down and died but i didn't know i was dead i'm standing in this wonderful place i've totally forgotten about hell i don't remember earth i don't remember anything coming in my mind it's just so full of joy and happiness and there he is and i was just shocked because he looked so good um i mean the last time i'd seen him in the hospital he had no hair and he was all lumpy and purple and awful and now he looked great and and he's laughing and um I thought, wow, he doesn't know he's dead. And then he's really laughing. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute. That's a clue. If he's dead, I'm dead. That's why I feel so amazing. <laughs> I'm here with him and it's so exciting. And there were other things that happened that he and he showed me and talked about that I, I wasn't able to remember. And except he came right up to me and said, now, Mary Kay, you've got too much left to do. And I knew I was getting kicked out, man. I was so furious. I thought, oh, no, uh-uh, no. I mean, where's this free will thing? Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not going. And he just smiled. And that's when I went, found myself at the lovely little meadow and the stream. And I'm walking back. And, and uh, again, the heaven thing was gone. I was in the now. I was in this present of just walking. But generally, um, if people come back from heaven, a lot of times they'll have a little space in between, kind of a little settling time. So you don't get that yeah. jarring thing. And that was that was cool, you know. But then uh, when I got to the bottom of the stream, I'd met a couple of people who told me that I, I should marry um, Glenn. And uh, so when I woke up, Oh my gosh, uh, I, again, had no idea where I was. I was afraid I, I was in hell because I couldn't move and I was hot. And um, there was a bunch of people in this big white room and they're milling around. And again, it's just like too much. It was just too much. And so finally, my poor son-in-law was sitting next to me and says, uh oh, mother's back. My daughter says, oh, I wanted to be there when she came out of it. And my mom is there and my dad and they're rushing around me and they're all so happy. And I thought, who are these people? Mm. And why have they, I felt like I was in duct tape with a, a heater on me. I said, you know, I couldn't move. Well, it turned out I had been for three weeks on a nasal tube with Insure. So I went from my usual perky 102 pounds down to 86 and I had no muscle mass at all. And I couldn't move anything but one little finger at the tip and blink. And the, the thing in my throat, so I couldn't talk. And they took away my estrogen pills. So now I've got hat flashes on top of everything else. <laughs> and my mother's had coming at me with a blank and saying, you look cold. And I said, I, <laughs> and they well, sent me back for what? How am I going to do anything? I can't even move. So I was uh, not happy. Well, the hell on earth is 
a little bit better than the hell you experienced in hell, I, I must say. Kathy, we are sa- sadly we are out of time. But okay. tell the listeners how they can how they can find your website and how they can get a copy of your book. Sure. It's just like the title. And I didn't fit in hell because I kept saying no. And then I got thrown out of heaven and um, I'm an expat doing my work on earth till I get to go home. So it's misfit in hell to heavenexpat.com. Or you put a www there. Or you can go on to Amazon and look it up that way. But uh, the book has a lot more in it. And the book also has a lot of humor in it, lightness. And Help amazing, for you amazing every stories day. about your extended family, I must say. So you like that, including <laughs> your uncle Kenny, who had, saw demons himself. So oh yeah, oh yeah, he got sent back too. Scared the hell out of my parents too because <laughs> they, he had a sheet over him in the hospital. And they told him he was dead, and he sat straight up in bed. Uh, <laughs> Kathy, thank you so much. You're and, welcome. Uh, this has been this has been wonderful talking with you. For more about the work of IANS, listeners should go to IANDS.org and discover what Kathy and I have both discovered, that it's a very helpful and useful organization. And tune in again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thank you for listening. Thank you.